I looked at my watch. I realized I was late for work. So I popped up. I said, Chica, her name was Chica. I said, Chica, I have to go. And she said, no, Mr. Mitch, stay in color with me. And I said, Chica, I have to work. And she said, Mr. Mitch, I have to play. And I said, <laughs> okay, but it's not the same thing. Life is like a roller coaster, but it's better when we go through it together. Welcome to the Candace Cameron Bury Podcast Christmas Special. At Christmas, I love all the jingle bells and the fireplaces and the Christmas music and hot cocoa, and I love being with my family. When the Christmas season rolls around and we talk about the story of Jesus's birth, it's a reminder to not take the gifts of life for granted. So this year, I am asking my guests to share stories about how giving has changed their lives. My guest today is Mitch Album. He's an incredible storyteller, one of the most prolific writers of our time who wrote the book Tuesdays with Maury, which is the number one selling memoir of all time. Mitch has over 10 top New York Times bestsellers, both fiction and nonfiction, including The Five People You Meet in Heaven and Have a Little Faith. And his books have sold over 40 million copies. But what you might not know is that Mitch and his wife have started seven charities, including an orphanage in Haiti and the first ever 24-hour medical clinic for homeless children in America. more. Mitch, welcome to my podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Candace. I'm, I'm in Haiti right now. So it's a bit of a miracle just the fact that we even have electricity to talk to you. So <laughs> this is already it, a, a blessed event. It certainly is. So let's just start there. You're in Haiti. I, I think I know why you're in Haiti, but I would love for you to share. Well, as you, you, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, we have an orphanage here that I came here in 2010, right after the terrible earthquake that killed 3% of Haiti's Mm -hmm. population. And I got involved with an orphanage, fell in love with the kids, uh, started bringing guys down to help. At that time, there were no toilets, there were no showers, there was no kitchen, uh, there was no school, there was nothing. The kids, it was poverty like we don't know in America. And we started building all those things. And the uh, pastor who was here uh, running it, I kept noticing that the kids were still starving, even though we were coming down every month and building things. And I said, well, what's going on? And he said, well, I'm 84 years old and I don't really have money to run this place and haven't for a long time. And in one of those moments that you look back on in your life and you say, what was I thinking? I blurted out like, well, I could probably run this place. I run some charities in Detroit mm-hmm. if you want. And he basically said, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Here it is. And, <laughs> um, and he left wow. and, um, and, and we didn't see him again. And uh, I've been running it ever since with my wife. And we're here every month, been here every month since 2010 of January. And um, we have 60 plus kids at any given time. There's a beautiful school here. They go to school four hours in English and four hours in French every day. Wow. They, they eat well, they sleep well, they pray well, and they get to go to college. And in fact, we now have 12 of our kids are in universities in the United States, and one of them is in medical school. And so um, we keep taking in new kids every year. As you probably Amazing. know, Haiti's in a very, very dire state now. Yes. And so that's why that's why I'm here. This is my monthly visit. And then you happen to catch me when I'm here. Wow. (laughs) I'm just blown away. I'm blown away at the willingness to just take on an entire orphanage and uproot your life in that way, because I can't imagine that that would be a very comfortable decision to make, at least at the start. Well, did you ever have some decision in your life, Candace, that you kind of blurted something out, meaning to do good, and then you found out that you were actually obligated to do the good? <laughs> has that ever happened I've to you? certainly made some commitments in my life, yes, where I, I kicked myself after and said, why did I do that? But it yeah. really does move you into, if you are a person of your word, it, it moves you into action. And commitment is right. a very important thing in my life. And I always want to be a woman of my word. So if I say it, I'm going to do it. And sometimes that's the very thing 
that God bring God brings you to for that change in your life, whatever that is. And that's exactly what I was going to say. That you know, you may say it in a moment of, well, I'm just trying to be nice, but then you find out that um, you know maybe God was directing you to be that nice and. This has turned out to be the greatest blessing in my life. I believe in my wife's life as well, to have all these children in our lives. Many of them live with us in in Detroit when they are sick. Mm -hmm. Uh, Medical issues, we bring them up and we've gotten to know them so well. And they're they're our children. And, uh, uh, you know, there's no it doesn't matter what the DNA is. You know, for us, they're our our children Mm -hmm. and we love them and we love being with them. That's incredible. So I I would like to go back a little bit to Tuesdays with Maury, which I know you've been talking about this book forever, but, and you were a sports writer before that even happened. I remember reading this book when it came out, Cried Like a Baby. And I'm also not, I'm not a big reader in the sense, I read a lot of scripts (laughs) all year long. So I don't do a lot of free reading in, in my spare time, but this book was unbelievable, which is why it's sold as many copies as it has. And, but for some of my listeners who may be younger, they might not be familiar with the book. And I would love for you to share about Maury and this journey, because I know this is a huge source of giving in your life and what you've learned from, from giving and taking with that relationship with Maury. Yeah. So Maury Schwartz was a college professor at Brandeis University. Um, he stood about, you know, five foot five. It was kind of small. He had silver hair, green eyes. He had a great way of making you feel like you were the first student he'd ever taught. I met him on the very first day of classes at that school. I had signed up for one of his classes. It was kind of funny because I walked into the classroom and there were nine kids in the class. And I immediately said, no, this is too small a class. If I cut it, they'll know I'm not here. And, and, and I, I wanted a you know, much bigger class. And so I was actually leaving the room to drop the class. And he began to call roll. And one of the problems when your last name begins with A is mm. that you can't get out quickly <laughs> enough. And he said, Mitchell album. And I kind of um, slid back into the room out of guilt. And I said, here. And he said, is it Mitch or Mitchell? Which do you prefer? And I was kind of pleased that he asked me that because I have one of those names, Mitch, Mitchy, Mitchell. And so I said, well, Mitch, my friends call me Mitch. And he said, OK, Mitch, it is. And he said, a Mitch. And I said, yeah. And he said, I hope one day you'll think of me as your friend. Hmm. So I knew that cutting the class was out of the question at that point. <laughs> and yes. that began that began this amazing relationship that we had for four, all four years. I took every class he offered. I, I majored in sociology because of him. We really became more like an uncle. and and a nephew, you know, over that time. And then when I graduated, I promised I would stay in touch. And I went out into the world and I got very involved in my career, my ambition, making money, becoming well known. And I became a very successful sports writer and broadcaster. I was on ESPN every week, Mm -hmm. you know, wrote a big column for a big newspaper in Detroit, traveled around the world, met a lot of famous athletes. And I broke that promise to him every day, week, month, and year for 16 years while I was busy chasing my own mm. tail and uh, only got back in touch with him when one night I happened to be flipping the remote control in my house and I came upon the Nightline program and saw him talking to Ted Koppel about what it was like to die from Lou Gehrig's disease. And that's how I found out that he had ALS mm. and only had months left to live. So I went to visit him out of guilt. I thought I would visit him once. And he was so amazing when I visited him, you know, even though he was dying, he seemed so much more content with his life than I was. And he never talked about the pain or the illness. He talked about all the amazing things he was learning in the last stages of his life. And I, when I went home that night, I said, you know, you're 37, perfectly healthy. He's 78 and dying. And he seems 10 times happier with his life than you are. What's the matter with this picture? And yeah, I began to go back every Tuesday, that next Tuesday, the next Tuesday, the next Tuesday, the next Tuesday. And we did like a class together in what you know when you're really going to die, not when you think one day I'm going to die, mm-hmm. but when you're really going to die, that puts everything into perspective. And wouldn't it be great to have that perspective, you know, now when we're young enough and healthy enough to do something about it. And, um, uh, we did this every week. And at one point he told me he didn't have any money to pay his medical bills. 
and that he was afraid that once he died, he was going to leave his family with all this debt. Mm. So I got the idea to write a book to pay his medical bills. And Candace, would you believe that uh, we went around to a bunch of publishers, just me, and he couldn't obviously go. And I told him what was going on. I said, I just need enough money to pay his medical bill. And everybody said, no, boring. You're a sports writer. It's depressing. No, I mean, nobody wanted to publish it. And finally, you know, three weeks before he died, we found one publisher and they gave me, you know, just enough money to pay his bills. And I went and told him he didn't know I was going to try to do this. And I went to him and I said, listen, all this talk, all this class we've been doing, I, there's someone wants to publish a book about it. And he got very excited. And I said, well, not only that, but you're not going to they're going to give us money. I want you to take the money and pay off your medical bills so you don't have to die thinking that you're going to, you know, yeah. um, leave your family in debt. And really, to be honest, that was probably the first act of giving that I had ever done in my life. That was what you would call kind of selfless, you know. So I let and me, that started the whole let process. Me, I have a question, though. What what gave you the confidence that you knew you could write a book? about that topic and under pressure because of the, the, the window of time that would sell, that, that you could sell to a publisher that would give you money. Just that what, where did that confidence come from and the idea of it? Um, I think it was more desperation than confidence. It was that I felt like I had to help him. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, if I had if it was just a book idea, like for one of my other books, mm -hmm. and I had gone to that many publishers and they had told me no, it would be like you and your business. If you've got an idea for a movie and you start going around to different studios and everybody tells you that's the worst movie I've ever done. Come on, nobody's going to make it. After yeah. nine or 10 people, you go, okay, maybe it's a bad idea. Right. But if you were doing it, if you were doing it to help somebody else, then you can't give up. Yeah. Right. There's a big difference between yep. your own ego and, and having to disappoint somebody else. So I kept pushing until we found somebody. I, I wouldn't call it confidence. I was I was just determined and desperate to get help for him. And and honestly, Candace, you know, I wrote the book after he died. You know, uh, they gave us the money mm -hmm. in advance. I gave it to him. He knew. And then I wrote the book very, very simply. And um, nobody expected it to be a big book. At all. I mean, they only printed 20,000 copies. They thought I thought I'd have them in the trunk of my car for the rest of my mm -hmm. life. And, um, you know, then it came out in August of 1997, which is not exactly a big month for book reading, right. you know, of, about, you know, meaning of life books, maybe a beach book. But people started to read it, started to read it, started to hand it to somebody, hand it to somebody, you should read this, you should read this. And, and it just went you know, and it kept going and still goes today. And today it's in 50 different countries. It's taught in schools all around the world. It's taught in, in, in Sweden and in China and Australia and Japan and in all those different languages. And I always say to people, look at how large a man's classroom has grown mm. for a guy who's not even here to teach it. You know, right. he never read a word of Tuesdays with Maury, but he touches people all over the world, including you. And, um, you know, it just shows you the impact that one life can have when you touch another life and another life and another life. You never yes. know where the ripples in the, in the, in the pond are going to end. Yes. Yes. So can you tell us what did Maury teach you about giving? What was, what was the biggest mm. takeaway for you? So there's, that's a, a good question and I can answer it very specifically because I remember very specifically people used to come to visit Maury on the other days besides Tuesdays. And sometimes they would come when I was there. And these were people who had seen him on the Nightline program who didn't know him that well, but they felt like they should visit. And they were kind of nervous to talk to a man who was dying because ALS is a very ravaging disease. Mm -hmm. And so Maury was, you know, kind of stiff in a chair and you had to kind of turn his head just to have him look at you. And it, it's tough, you know. Mm -hmm. So they would come in with a, a, a philosophy. They'd say, I'm going to tell him jokes. I'm going to show him pictures of my kids. I'm going to be upbeat, 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 upbeat. And the door would close and they would stay in there an hour and that door would open and they'd come out in tears. Mm. But they would be crying about their love life, their divorce, their job, their prop. And, and they said, well, I don't know what happened. I went in to try to cheer him up and spent about five minutes. And then he started asking me questions. So I answered. They started really asking me questions. I really started asking. They were really asking. Me. Next thing I know, I was crying and telling him everything. I tried to cheer him up, but he ended up cheering me up. So I went to him one day and I said, I don't understand. You're the one who's dying. Uh -huh. You've hit the mother load of sympathy. 
why don't you just accept, you know, people feeling sorry for you, want to make you feel better? And he said, Mitch, why would I ever take from people like that? Taking just makes me feel like I'm dying. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. And I've never forgot that sentence. And I've never forgot that event. And uh, it's a real simple philosophy. And I thought when a man is dying is what makes him feel vital and alive to give of himself to somebody else. Then there must be something very powerful about that in our lives. And I have found ever since that that's true. I never feel more alive than when I'm giving to other people. I never feel more alive than when I'm here at this orphanage with kids in my lap. And uh, I'm really lucky that I learned that lesson at 37, you know, and I'll never forget it. You, you've, thank you for sharing that. I'm in tears right now. Um, I'm a sensitive person and having that reminder is incredible. And I'm so glad that you shared that for all of our viewers and our listeners, because because it's the truth. And when you're faced with that, faced with a person right in front of you telling you that, it's incredibly impactful. I mean, I'm, I'm bawling over here with you repeating the story and it's been many years. So I can only imagine how that really shaped your life from that day going forward. And I would love for you it to sh share more stories about how the, the journey of that moment of the teaching, what he taught you has impacted your life. Uh, I would say the ways that it changed were very tangible. I formed my first charity that year, 1995. Um, I formed eight other ones in Detroit since. Um, I started something continuum called, that's called Say Detroit, which now has nine operations underneath it. And it went from a small, small thing to a multi-million dollar charity that, that, that helps, you know, everybody from little kids all the way up to senior citizens and homeless. And we built the first uh, uh, clinic for homeless children in America yeah. right in Detroit because it was a profound problem. Um, I would say probably it's interesting because I learned a lesson from a very old man. And then I learned the same lesson from a very little girl uh, about 25 years later um, here in Haiti, where I am. Uh, we had a little girl named Chica mm -hmm. who was a beautiful little girl uh, who uh, was born three days before the earthquake and survived the earthquake when the little house that she was in, the roof, it collapsed, but the roof fell backwards. And so she was on her mother's chest three days old and the whole house collapsed and they were just looking at the sky, but they lived. Wow. And so I always say she was born pretty tough, you know, and um, yeah. two years later, her mother died giving birth to a baby brother and she was brought to our orphanage. And two years, three years later, she was five years old and she developed a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we brought her to the States thinking that, um, well, the doctors there will take care of her and, you know, they're brilliant doctors in America and she's just a kid, whatever it is, they'll fix it. We'll bring her back. And we were told that when they did the surgery, they came out and they said, this is something really bad. It's called DIPG. It kills anybody who has it. She has maybe four months left to live. And all of a sudden my wife and I were like, what, you know, like we just brought her up. We thought this is going to be, you know, a little quick surgery yeah. and we'll go down. And now you're telling us she's going to die. What should we do? And they said, well, you know, we would take her back to Haiti and just let her just let her die quietly. You know, it's nothing mm -hmm. you can do about it. And my wife and I looked at one another. We said, you don't know this girl. She's a fighter. You know, she was born into an earthquake. She'll fight. And if she'll fight, we'll fight. So you better start telling us <laughs> where the experimental treatments are. Put and the gloves um, on. We, we, we took Chica in and she lived not four months or eight months or 12 months or 16, but she lived two years. And those two years were an incredible incredible um experience to have this child in our lives in our in our 50s mm -hmm. you know when she came into our lives and she taught me as i said similar lesson to maury towards the end of her life she couldn't walk either like maury couldn't walk and i had to carry her from place to place which was perfectly fine with her she loved mm -hmm. that you know like i was her personal taxi service take her to the car <laughs> take her to the bathroom yes. were, and um one time we were we were coloring and she said, I looked at my watch. I realized I was late for work. So I popped up. I said, Chica, her name was Chica. I said, Chica, I have to go. And she said, no, Mr. Mitch, stay and color with me. And I said, Chica, I have to work. 
And she said, Mr. Mitch, I have to play. And I said, <laughs> okay, but it's not the same thing, you know, because this is my job. And she crossed her arms and she looked, you know, very stern. And she said, no, it isn't. Your job is carrying me, you know. And I <sighs> thought about that sentence. First, mm. I laughed because she was like that. Yeah. And then I said, wow, you know, there's never going to be a truer sentence than that. My job was carrying her. And I thought about there's a picture of me carrying her like this. You know, she's smiling and I'm laughing. And I realized for so much of my life, I, I, I would carry my books, my work, my money, my paychecks, my notoriety. And then you have to drop all that to carry a sick child, you know, yes. and there's no comparison between the two. What we carry is who we are. What we choose to carry is who we are. And it's just like giving is living, you know, what you're going to carry in your life, those that you're going to help are going to define who you are. And you're either going to carry your own stuff or you're going to carry somebody else, you know, and I learned from her that there's no comparison between, you know, carrying a child versus carrying your own, your own that notoriety. Is a, that or, is a word right now. That is an absolute word for, for all of our listeners and for me to hear. And I, as I listen to you speak, you seem like the most selfless man on the planet. <laughs> oh, I promise you that's not true. <laughs> I could bring my wife over here on this uh, Zoom and I'm sure that she would uh, confirm that, uh, you know, so, no, I have moments, but. Uh, well, I, I, this is, uh, this question wasn't planned, but I wanted to know if you would be willing to share a little bit about your faith background or faith journey, because a lot of your books have to do with faith, at least within the title. And there's, you always are talking about God from some perspective in many of your books as well. And right. I am really curious what, what your faith looks like, because clearly you're living out your faith in your life. And could you share some of that with us? Sure. Sure. So I was raised Jewish, born Jewish, raised Jewish. Um, I had a pretty uh, intense religious ex uh, education when I was younger and then kind of went off to college and said, well, okay, I know all that and sort of forgot about it, you know, and, and really didn't participate in a whole lot of anything for the next 20 years or so. And then I married my beautiful wife, Janine, who is a devout Christian and very faithful. And uh, I remember we were talking uh, one time when we were talking about possibly having children and what faith we would raise them in. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, it doesn't matter to me which faith, but it matters to me that they have to have faith. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she said, it can't be no faith. And I was very inspired by that. You know, and I have to this day been inspired by my wife who and her, her Christian beliefs. The orphanage we operate is a Christian orphanage here in Haiti. Um, and I'm of the belief that as long as your faith is practiced honestly and, and um, you know, without harm to other people. You don't use your religious beliefs to justify hurting other people or mm -hmm. insulting other people by saying we're the only ones who were blessed. You know, uh, I remember talking to a rabbi, I wrote a book uh, a number of books ago called Have a Little Faith, mm -hmm. which was about a rabbi and a pastor, mm -hmm. uh, a suburban rabbi and an inner city pastor and how, how they had such similarities in one another. And I asked this rabbi one time, um, he was, he had a lot of friends who were Christian and Hindu and whatever. And I said, well, how can you do that? Like, aren't you supposed to root for your own team? You know, right. that kind of thing. Uh, and he said, well, he said, I kind of look at it this way. He said, do you think that God made trees? And I say, yeah. And he said, okay, why did God make trees? Why didn't God just make tree? You know, God, everything God makes is perfect. Why didn't God just make a tree? And that's all the only trees that were ever on earth were the tree that God made. Mm -hmm. Instead, he made oak and pine and fir and spruce and all the rest of it. He said, well, maybe that's what different faiths are, are all different ways that God made to all lead up. He said, but like the branches of the tree, we all reach up to him, you know, mm -hmm. to God in heaven. And, and as long as that's what we're doing, you know, we're all kind of God's children. And, um, you know, I believe that that's a good way to look at, at, at faith and be accepting of other faiths. Um, and, you know, it's a huge part of my life now, obviously, as you can 
as you can tell, not only by my books, but by, you know, being here at a Christian orphanage. And, um, I, 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 I don't know how people get by without faith, honestly. Um, I don't know too many either. challenges, you know, yeah, too yeah. many challenges. Um, I remember a, another a story that this rabbi told me one time about a man who was an atheist and he used to always, um, poke fun at this rabbi, you know, for his beliefs. He used to, he was a dentist and he used to schedule the rabbi's appointments on Saturdays because that's a day that he couldn't come, you know, mm -hmm. because that's the Sabbath mm -hmm. in the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. And he would always have to call and say, I can't come on Saturday. And he knew that he was doing it deliberately just to like poke fun at his yeah. faith. And then this man lost his, uh, lost his wife, I believe, or his brother. And the rabbi went to go pay him a condolence call. And you know, even though he wasn't a person of faith, but that was what the rabbi wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And he went to his house and the man was crying and he looked at him and he said, you know, I'm, I'm envious of you. And the rabbi said, what do you mean you're envious of me? He says, because I have, I don't believe in anything and I have nobody to blame this on. I have nobody to ask any questions of, you know, I, I, I can't, there's nothing. I have nothing. I lost somebody I love and I have nothing. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, if it was you, you would be talking to God or you'd think that they were in heaven or whatever, but I have nothing. And I, I envy you. And it was a whole different side of this person. And you could see, you know, what a life without it, faith, where yes. that leaves you in the end, you know. Um, but I don't tell anybody else what to do. You know, I, 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 I'm a very much live and let live person. Um, but for me, you know, faith is a big part of what I do and what I write about. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I very much appreciate it. And I know our listeners will too, very much. You've heard me talk about my new network, Great American Family Channel. It is the place to find your new favorite holiday movies all year around. If you're like me and you love to snuggle up on the couch with a blanket and a warm drink to watch the best new original Christmas movies of the season, then you're going to want to watch Great American Family Channel. How do you find Great American Family Channel? Well, you can text the word Christmas to 877-999-1225 for more details. Great American Family Channel is the fastest growing channel on television where we value family, faith, and country. You are not going to want to miss everything we're making for you on Great American Family and our streaming platform, Great American Pure Flix. Text the word Christmas to 877-999-1225 to find out how to watch. That's Christmas to 877-999-1225. I, I want to talk about your new book. It's called The Little Liar, and it's set all around the Holocaust. I started, I've started reading yeah. this book. I haven't finished it yet. I am, I mean, it's so beautifully written around a really difficult topic. And I, I'm, yeah. I'm just amazed at how, how you can weave it in with such the storytelling with such heart and, and, and yet there's a simplicity with something that is just so over the top, um, horrible, dramatic and disgusting. So I want to know, like, thank you for writing this book. I, 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 because I haven't finished it yet. I'm just, I can't, I can't wait because it's it's killing me knowing that this little boy is so Nico is so honorable in his truth telling and then gets manipulated in what he thinks yeah. is telling the truth to tell a very big lie that is going to kill thousands of people. Um, so what made you want to write this story? Well, thank you for, first of all, taking time to read The Little Liar, being in the middle of it. And uh, I think it's a very important book. I didn't know when I wrote it that it would be coming out during a time of such turmoil in the Mideast. That was where my next a lot question. Of the themes are, yeah, they're sort of repeating themselves. But I, I had always, you know, I grew up knowing about the Holocaust. I grew up with people who had survived it, people in my extended family who had lost almost everybody. Um, and I always knew one day I wanted to do some story about it, but I didn't want to write the same book that's been written many, many mm -hmm. times before. You know, it, 
just it's all set in a concentration camp and how terrible things are. And not that those books aren't great. It's just it's been done before. They mm-hmm. don't need me to, to add to that. But I've also always been interested in truth and lying. And I think that I think about the biggest lie that we've ever told. And I think about the ways that we try to make up for that in our lives or ask to be forgiven for that in our lives. And it's something that all of us share because all of us have told lies at some point or another. And I heard a story at a museum many years ago about that, how during the Holocaust, the Nazis, in order to get the Jews to get on the trains that would take them to the concentration camps, obviously you're not going to tell people you're getting on trains, going to concentration camps, nobody's going to get on. So they would lie to them and tell them that they were going to someplace good where they were going to have jobs and they were going to get new homes and they would get Jewish people to actually do the lying. They would force them, they would Mm. kidnap them and they would say, you know, if you don't, we're going to kill you. And they had to lie to their own people and to to trick them into getting on the train. And so I said this story in Greece, which many people don't realize was, Mm -hmm. was, you know, invaded by the Nazis. Many people think Greece was just always, you know, it's South and it's hot and probably wasn't involved with World War II, but it was. And uh, a city there that had a big Jewish population. And there's a boy, Nico, as you point out, who's never told a lie in his life. He's 11 years old. And the whole village where he lives, they all know him as honest Nico. You know, he never lies. Mm -hmm. And when the Nazis invade, they find out about him and they kidnap him and they trick him and they tell him, all you have to do is stand on the train platform and tell the people that everything's good and they're going to go to their jobs, which is true. And then we'll let you go back to your family. So he does this thinking this is the way he's going to get back to his family. And and the people believe him because he's never lied. And train after train goes out this way. And on the very last train, he sees his own family being put on the train and he discovers what's happening. Someone says they're not taking us to jobs. They're going to kill us. And he realizes that he's been tricked and he's been lying all this time. And he runs to go join his family. And the Nazi who tricked him grabs him and keeps him off the train. And so his family is sent away and he's left on the train tracks Um, and he jumps on the tracks. and He starts running after the train to try to catch it. And the book follows him from that moment when he's 11 all the way till when he's in his 50s and how his life was shaped by that one lie that he Mm -hmm. was forced to tell and how he spent the rest of his life trying to be forgiven for it and how his brother who doesn't forgive him because he thinks he knew what he was doing, tries to find him and, 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 and capture him, you know, and make him pay for it. And he becomes a pathological liar. He can't tell the truth anymore. It won't come out of his mouth because you, can you imagine if you tell a truth that's so, that you feel so guilty about, mm-hmm. uh, you tell a lie that you feel so guilty about, you, you know, you don't even know how to tell the truth anymore. And it yeah. just follows, it's, it's not, you know, the book itself is only, there's only a part of it that's in a concentration camp. So the rest of it are the years after and how it affects his love mm-hmm. life and, uh, you know, what happened to the Nazi and all the rest. And mostly, Candace, it's a book about truth mm-hmm. and lying and the, and, and the price we pay when we pervert the truth. And when we, you know, when we do live in a world where a lot of people make up their own truths. Yeah. And just kind of you know follow what they want to believe, and they think that's what it is, and that's not what God intended when God created the truth. You know, there's one. That's it. And yeah. and you you know you can't pervert it. So it was a fascinating book to write. And I had no idea it would become timely, but uh, it is hopeful in the end. I can give you the since you're only part way through. <laughs> I've been left little, on the train tracks. He the yeah, train okay. has just left with his family in it. So he's just ran down the tracks and that's where I'm at. Right. Well, take heart. There there does have an inspirational ending and a hopeful ending. I don't, I don't really like to write books. I don't write any books that have negative endings or, you know, angst ridden endings. You know, I always, that's why they're so beloved. I uh, I believe in the same thing. That's why I make movies that always have a happy ending. (laughs) I know that about you. And I, and I imagine that that's been hard for you. I'm curious to ask you that because someone once said to me that someone once wrote a review about me and they were making fun of me Mm. and they wrote, he's the king of hope. Mm -hmm. And I said, how is that an insult? Like (laughs) that to me is like, that's about the best honor I can have. So I'm curious if you, if you're in your desire to make things, you know, be they films, TV things or Mm -hmm. whatever that are hopeful and upbeat, do you run into, you know, resistance 
And uh, because a lot of people like dark, you know, they, they like do. dark and edgy and action. Let's have nobody happy at the end. Let's have yeah. everybody dead at the end. Let's have nobody. <laughs> right. How do you go against? How do you go against that in your world? Yeah, I've I, I've definitely been mocked and made fun of for all of the happy programming and content that I've made over the years. But I've always felt an innate desire to only do programming that feels fam family friendly and hopeful. I've always been intentional in my career. So even when they the reviews come out and it's like as cheesy as cheese cheesy can be. Mm -hmm. I just take it as the compliment because I know the families like my family, um, but countless families I've encountered that have had very difficult circumstances in their life that look to this type of programming and these types of movies that take them out of their distraught life and give them hope and give them a laugh and give them entertainment that allows them to just walk away for those few minutes out of their circumstances. And I'm a person that sees the world with the, the glass half full. And so I, yeah. I take it as a compliment and I'll never stop doing it. And, and, and sometimes I've gotten those comments. It's like, well, you're not talented enough to do this gritty stuff. And I've, I've come across those parts and I've actually gotten those parts and I've turned them down and then realized I'm just not even going to audition or, yeah. or go towards that because it's not the content I want to do because I like making people feel hopeful and laugh. Do you think they told C.S. Lewis, you're not a talented enough writer <laughs> to write a murder mystery? You know, uh, maybe he just chose to write topics that inspired him. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think you, I'm, you're talented enough to do anything you want to do. The fact that you chose to do this, I think is, is, is very laudable and needs to, because it's real easy to just follow the pack. Mm -hmm. And if that's, what's going to get you work, if that's, what's going to, you know, and I, I've had that in my own career, yeah. you know, like I could have written things that, uh, you know, let's just try killing a few more people. And again, and, <laughs> right. you know, like, I never, there was never a curse word in Tuesdays with Maury. There was no curse words in it. And so then when that book started, you know, became what it became, I instantly felt, well, I have all these readers now. I can't, I can't curse in a mm. book because they're all going to say, well, you know, so I've now written 11 other books without a curse word in it. You know, I, I maybe damn, you know, uh, and it's really hard. Because in today's world, you know, they think they is. think like the more you use the, the more you use the F word, the more artistic you are. Right. You know, and it's like, no, it's actually a lot harder not to use it. So much because harder. Because you got to try to make something different. Right. I completely yeah. agree. And, and I'm so grateful that you haven't. That's what, uh, just another reason that draws me to your books. And yeah, I, I know I could I could talk about this all day long because I also grew up with comedians and it is so much harder to have clean comedy. It's harder to have clean content. Right. It's harder to write clean books right. because it, it, I just think it's well, all the things that you said, it's easy to just yeah. go there. Well, I, and <laughs> I salute you for doing that. And I don't Thank think, you, you know, you, you'll hear people say it's sentimental. You hear critics write, oh, this is so sentimental. <laughs> And I, I, I want to say to them, since when did sentimental become a bad word? Ask anybody to open their wallet and take out the photo that they have in their wallet. What is it? Is it a picture of their bank account? Is it a picture of their uh, uh, some serious issue or their voting record or their mm -hmm. politics? Or is it a picture of their grandchildren, you know, yep. uh, which is sentimental? You know, what's everybody's favorite song? Is it the song that's the most complicated, uh, 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 you know, chord structure? Or is it the song that was playing when they met their girlfriend who became their wife and they danced to it back in the 50s or 60s or 70s? Right? It's sentimental. So sentimentality is, 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 is at the heart of everybody's heart. And yep. yet somehow it's become a dirty word in Hollywood or in book reviews mm -hmm. or things like that. And I've, I've reached the point in my career where I'm just too old to care <laughs> about that kind of, uh, you know, uh, and I, I wish I don't. had been younger. Yeah, I wish I had been younger when I became too old to care. I, you know, it, it right. took me a while. Right. But, uh, but I, I, I just I know what people like and what moves them. And I write for them. I don't write for, you know, critics or otherwise. And I salute you for doing the same. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, I salute you and I'm grateful for you. So as we, as we wrap this up, we always take a listener question on the podcast. And these questions have come from previous seasons, but I try to match up a question that I think would be, um, would just be interesting for my guests to answer. So if you can help me out on this question, I'm going to read it. It's from Erin. She says, how can we have a healthy relationship with money? I donate and I have a good income, but I still feel afraid of future insecurity. And I often feel guilty about having a good income. So mm. she's, she has a good income. Sometimes she feels guilty. She, but she's still, she's still afraid of losing money at the same time. So it's having that grip. I think that's what her point is. It's having so much of a grip on money. And, and how does she work out a healthy relationship with money? Do you have any wise advice for us? Uh, yes. I don't know if it's wise, <laughs> but I, I can, I've had been given advice about it by some wise people. Um, and I'll, I'll share, if you don't mind, I'll tell you one more story about Maury. Please. Um, the last conversation I had with Maury before he died, when he was very weak, he was holding my hand and he said, I want to ask you a favor. And I said, okay, what? He said, I want you to come to my grave when I die. And I said, well, I was going to do that anyhow. And he said, well, not the way other people do it. I want you to, you know, don't come and leave the car running, get out and put down some flowers, get back in, drive away. I want you to come when you have some time and bring a blanket, bring some sandwiches. And I want you to talk to me. And I said, wait a minute, you want me to come to a cemetery, have a picnic at your tombstone mm -hmm. and talk to the heir? And he said, yes, exactly. Just like we're talking now. And I said, well, it won't be like we're talking now because you won't be able to talk back. And he looked at me as if I were being very naive. And he said, well, Mitch, I'll make you a deal. After I'm dead, you talk, I'll listen. You know? And I <laughs> laughed at that when he said it. But I realized after he died, which was two days later, that in that sentence was everything he was trying to teach me. Because mm. if you spend your life as he did with people, making time for people, giving of yourself to people, then when you die, you're not 100% gone. You live on inside the heads and hearts of everybody you touch. You made memories. They can remember you. They remember you at the dinner table. Oh, if, if she was, if Candace was here, she would say that because she would, she always did this or you know, if they go out to, you know, swimming. Oh, if Candace was here because you were there, you were doing it. You were making the memories with them. But if you work all day, if you fret over your money all day, if you sit and try to figure out your bank account all day, then when you get to the end, and you're in that last moment of your life, think about all that you have earned and accumulated. None of it gives you any comfort. It's in a safe, it's, it's in a, the garage, it's in your bank account. It won't hold you, it won't, it won't comfort you, it won't say anything to you. All that matters in that last drop of sand through the hourglass is, is that your loved ones are there. You can hold their hand. You can tell them how much you love them. They can tell you how much they love you. That's the way we all want to say goodbye, right? If we get our choice. And so I would say to this reader, listener, um, think about that when you make your decisions about your money. Mm -hmm. um, we have plowed an awful lot of money into this orphanage where I am right now. A lot of money. A lot of money. <laughs> of our money. Um, but I think about all the children that we have in our life, um, now and all the memories and when they get married, their children and all that. And I think, would I trade all these children that I'm going to have to get some of that money back? I wouldn't even think twice about it, you know? Right. And there's a point at which when you give it away, it comes back to you in spades, you know? And yes. I think what she sounds like. The, 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 the listener understands that a little because she said, you know, I, I think it's a she. Yep. She said, I, I like to, you know, I, I like to I give, donate. but I still feel guilty about, yeah, I donate, but I, I, I it sounds like she's sort of like, I don't want to donate too much because I want right. to make sure I've got right. it for myself. 
I, all I know is everybody I know who has given away has gotten back much, much more. And if you want to have those conversations to have people be able to talk to you after you're gone, it's not going to be in how much money you make. It's not going to be in how big a stock portfolio you get. When you die, no matter how much money you have, they're just going to fight over it after you're gone. Mm. That's what happens, you know? Yeah. But did you leave any memories? You know, did you, yeah. did you leave, you know, uh, an impression in someone's heart that they're going to hold on to, you know, that's, that's being rich to me. That's, that's how you're wealthy. When I meet people who have beautiful children and grandchildren, I always say to them, you're one of the richest people I know. And they mm. say, what do you mean? I'm, I'm just, I'm just working, you know, working a regular job. I said, your job has nothing to do with it. Look at the love that you have around yeah. you. Look at how your kids love you, how your grandkids love you. You're rich. And that to me is, is what wealth is, you know, and, and I don't know if that helps her at all, if that's an answer to your question, but that's how I would answer. I think that's the best answer that anyone could give. I could listen to you at the pulpit all day long. You just gave a beautiful sermon <laughs> on money and heart. It's never happening. <laughs> that's never happening. Nope. Okay. <laughs> well, I loved it. Mitch, thank you so much for joining me and from all the way from Haiti. I, I really loved our conversation and I know it is going to bless everyone who's watching and listening. And I just appreciate your time so very, very much and all that you're doing. I appreciate what you do and the, the joy that you bring into the world. Please continue to do it. And thanks. Uh, you too. Happy to talk to you anytime. Thank you. you. Take care. The time leading up to Christmas is Advent, and it's a season of intentionally waiting, which is something we all experience and can learn from. My friend Bianca and I have a PDF guide for you called What to Do in the Waiting, and you can get it at Candice.com. I love answering listener questions with my guests, and there's an easy place at Candice.com to ask them. And we do read through all the questions and then decide on what to talk about in the upcoming season seasons. Until next time, be grateful all day, every day. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. Hit the like button if you've ever read Tuesdays with Maury. And let me know who you want me to interview for Christmas 2024. Candy Rock Entertainment. All rights reserved. <laughs>